Good morning. So we've been working our way through this letter to the Ephesians in the New Testament. And the key question we've been asking is simply this. Who do we think we are? Who do we think we are? And as we gather here this morning, Ephesians gives us an answer as to who we actually are. There's so much we can learn from in this letter. In chapter 1, we saw that we are a blessed church. A blessed church. In chapter 2, we saw that we are to be a built-up church, to be God's holy temple, filled with his presence. In chapter 3, we saw the business of the church to display this um, multicoloured um, uh, vision of God's grace to the world around about us, from people from all different backgrounds and, uh, and places, a Jew and Gentile together um, in Christ Jesus. And in chapter 4, we're coming on to another theme, and we're coming on to this theme of the church as the body, the body. I'm going to read from verses 1 through to 16. My text will come up alongside me this morning, and then I'm going to split this passage up into three sections and deal with it as we explore this most magnificent theme this morning. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, He led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Lord, we pray as we have heard your word read, and as we move on to meditating on your word and exploring it in a bit more depth this morning, that we would hear your voice speak deeply into our hearts and lives to shape us into the body you've called us to be. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. So a blessed church, a built-up church, the business of the church. And now we come to this most wonderful vision of the church of Jesus Christ as a body. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, Paul goes further then. He actually says to a church in the ancient city of Corinth, now you are the body of Christ. I don't know about you, but this is absolutely mind-blowing for me. Do you know, 
in the New Testament. The Bible, we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the New Testament, it starts with four books that detail for us the, the, the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection and the ascension of Christ Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Yeah? Straight after John, we have the book of Acts. Acts details the first 30 years of the church of Jesus Christ. Luke wrote a gospel about Jesus and also wrote the book of Acts. And he starts the book of Acts, this history of the church, with these words. Now, referring to my former book, I'm referring to his gospel about Jesus, and he says these words, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. Luke says, everything I wrote about Jesus, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, everything I wrote about Jesus, all of those things were just what Jesus began to do and teach. In other words, he was saying, and now when I tell you the story of the church, I'm telling you all that Jesus is continuing to do and teach. Why? Because God's plan for the church is that the church isn't a human body. The church isn't a human institution. The church isn't just any old body. The church is the body of Christ. Amen. The church is there to continue to do and to teach the things of Christ. Do you know, I, I don't know if you're, uh, you've had all the manifestos through your door for the political parties that are seeking election this week. Do you know, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, stood in the synagogue and he declared the greatest manifesto of all time. I'd vote for this all day long. Yeah. He said, the spirit of the Lord was upon, is upon me yeah. to, to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the captives yeah. and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to declare the year of the Lord's favour. That gets my cross in the box all day long. But the church is the body of Christ. And the ministry of the church is to continue that ministry of Christ in the world around about us. The Cannon Valley needs this. Our local authority needs this. Our nation needs this. Our world needs this. Yes. Yes. That Jesus Christ is present in this world today in and through his church. Amen. The body of Christ? In Ephesians chapter 4, we learn three vital things about what it means to be the body of Christ. This vision for who we're meant to be. Who do we think we are? This is who we are. But we are this church as we grasp three vital things about what it means to be a body. You see, the first vital thing about being a body is kind of a, a, a unity, a togetherness. To the body. You know, if my legs were wanting to go in one direction and my arms were wanting to reach out in another direction and my head was looking, wanting to look somewhere else and my ears were tuned into something across the other side of the room, it wouldn't end very well. No. There has to be some kind of togetherness to a body in order for that body to, to move. And in the same way, when it comes to the church, that's exactly what Paul <coughs> teaches here. He says that there has to be a togetherness to this church, yeah. a togetherness to the body of Christ. And that togetherness starts with verse 2, where it says, with all humility. Humility. You know, humility means to have... Um, a modesty. A modesty means to kind of operate within a given measure, not exceed or not go beyond the allotted measure. Um, it means to think of oneself as we ought to think, not in an overly inflated way, a prideful way, and not either also in a deflated way, stopping to realise the value that we are 
but before God. Humility is a correct appraisal of who we are and it's, it's being content with who we are. It's a loneliness of mind, a correct estimation of oneself. There's a, a, an ancient story told, sorry I don't want to bore you this morning, but there's an ancient story told of King Canute. Now King Canute lived and reigned a thousand years ago. He was a powerful king. He was king of Denmark and then he became king of uh, England, what's now England, and, and then he also became king of uh, what's now uh, Norway, part of Norway there. He had a big empire uh, around him and he was so used continually, because he was so powerful, people were constantly flattering him to try and get their way with him, you know, to, to try and get some, some, some power for themselves. And he was so fed up of the flattery that the story has it, whether it happened or not, it's history, we don't quite know. But the story goes, he took his throne, he got his courtiers to carry his throne down to the beach. And he sat it down by the shoreline. And as he sat down on his throne, he commanded the sea not to come in. And of course, within a few hours, the shore was lapping around his feet. People were looking at him as though to say, what are you going to do next? And he said these words. Let all men know how empty and worthless is the power of kings. For there is none worthy of the name but he whom heaven, earth and sea obey by eternal laws. A correct appraisal of oneself. <laughs> he was saying, yes, I'm a king. I know I'm a king. I know I'm a powerful man. But I know that I'm submitted before God. I know who I am before God. I don't have the powers to dictate time and tide. Wait for no man <laughs> indeed. Do you know, even this week, there'll be those that'll be putting their crosses in the box. Please vote, by the way. Can I just say that? Sorry, I'm, we don't use the pulpit in any shape or form to po promote political politics. But can I just say, as a pastor, please use your vote. It's a, it's a precious thing that we have in this country. So I'm not against voting. Please vote. But there'll be plenty of people um, putting their cross in, in the box this week. And um, do you know what? I think most of them will realise that really, all of these that stand for election, all the manifestos, all the best intentions, still there's something missing. How many times have you heard people say, nothing's going to change? <laughs> still something's missing. Why? Because actually <coughs> what we need as a nation is to return back to a right appraisal of ourselves before God. Amen. To know there is one who is greater. Yeah. Righteousness exalts a nation. And humility, and that humility is to be at work in the church. Why? Because pride always divides. It does, doesn't it? It really does. And so Paul here says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. He looks back on all that Jesus has done, that he's narrated, uh, uh, sorry, written in chapters 1 through to 3 of Ephesians. And he says, now in the light of this, walk worthy to it. How do you walk according to this? In a correct estimation of yourself before God. With humility of mind. Because pride always divides. Pride is taking a lofty, inflated position. Humility brings people together. You've, you've often heard me using that illustration of going to New York City for the first time and walking through New York and looking up at all the buildings and going, wow, they're big. Wow, that building's huge. And then finding my way along to um, uh, the Empire State Building and going up the Empire State Building and all of a sudden, I was on top, I was above pretty much most of the buildings I'd been looking at. Uh, and, and I was, uh, buildings? Oh, what buildings? <laughs> because the position you take will always determine how you view those around about you. Mm -hmm. 
and the inflated position. We've always made bigger people, what people? I'm, like, I'm more important in this equation. Not that person, I'm more important. But the low position goes, wow. <laughs> Look at the grace of God there in that life. That's why Paul says, you're, a, you're the body of Christ. Yeah. This is an amazing vision for the world around about you. The spirit of the Lord is upon you to preach the good news to the poor. How do we do it? There's got to be a togetherness to a body. Yeah. It's got to be the case. How does that happen? It always, 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 always starts with humility. Humility. And humility works itself out in, in gentleness. Humility produces patience. That word patience comes from the Greek word, which is makrothumos. Makrothumos. Makro as in big, large, and thumos as in to heat, to heat up. In other words, take a long time to heat up. <laughs> take a long time to lose your cool. That's what the word literally means. Patience at work bearing with one another in love i love that phrase because it's so real anybody else think that's real yeah. bearing with one another in love because sometimes you get so uh, I, i'm human yeah i know what this is like sometimes you can just get so cheesed off <laughs> oh they're doing it again and God's word is so real. It doesn't, it doesn't dress over that or pretend it's not real. It says, yep. Sometimes it's just about putting up with somebody in love. The love of Christ at work amongst his people. I've, been, I, I've suddenly got into Race Across the World. I don't know if you've seen that on the, the BBC, Race Across the World, where, where teams have to have to, you know, they have a budget and they have to literally travel like 10, 12,000 miles in different stages there. And, and as you watch that, I, Debbie and I have started watching through all the series on iPlayer. And as you watch that, it's really fascinating seeing the relationships between people. Because you know when you get people together for any length of time, you're always going to get friction. And the friction always comes out. Do you know why? Because it's normal. <laughs> it's really, really, really normal. <laughs> There's always going to be that kind of, that sense, whenever you've got people together in any situation, you're always going to have that in the church. We're called to something. We're called to something that begins with humility. And if we take that low position, and that I am who I am by the grace of God, and uh, uh, wow, Paul say, I'm a prisoner for the Lord. <laughs> Where I am, I'm content in what God has for me. I'm setting it down. If we take that low position, then we see that spirit's work of unity. The eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. This Holy Spirit's work is unity. It brings his people together. The counterproductive, the, the, the counter side of that, pulling people apart, is opposite to the spirit's work. We, we, we operate within the spirit's work in a bond of peace where there's that um, commitment to live in peace, one with the other. Why? Listen to this, verse 4. Because there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. Get the point? <laughs> seven times there. Seven times, not eight times. Seven times there. But Paul says, one, 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 one. And actually, in the original, in the grammar, it really comes across like that. It's like bang, 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 bang. One, one, one. He's making the point of what's at stake here. What a vision God has for his church, the church of Jesus Christ. It's a vision that the church of Jesus Christ is the body of Christ. How do we be that body? There's a vital thing we need to learn first. There has to be a togetherness within a body for it to be that effective body yeah. um, and so the challenge there is relationships relationships the next point if Dylan can just move us on the, the, the next point 
is that um, in order for the body, a vital thing for the body, to be the body of Christ, it needs to have a togetherness to it. The next thing I'd say is in order for us to be a healthy body, there needs to be a life to it. <laughs> a life to the body. And if the first was a challenge to our relationships, the second is a challenge to our understanding of what Christ has truly done for us. Paul says here, to each grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And then he goes on to quote, when he ascended on high, he led hosts of captives and he gave gifts to men. It's a quote from Psalm 68, verse 18. And what Paul is doing there is he is um, portraying a picture that his listeners would have got straight away. To us, 2,000 years later, perhaps we don't get this picture. They would have got this picture straight away. Uh, imagine the scene, a historical scene, of a conquering king returning from battle. And as he parades back into his city, he's there on a horse. Behind him are his troops. Behind the troops are the captives, a conquered army. Humiliated. And then behind that humiliated, conquered army are horses and carts, and the carts are filled with all the spoils of war. And the conquering king takes of those spoils of war and gives them out to his citizens. That's the picture of what Christ has done for us. Remember Ephesians 2 says we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Sin within us made sure we fell short of God and the wages of sin is death. But God in his rich mercy sent Christ to die on the cross for our sins and conquer over death. Why? Well, it means quite simply that it means quite simply that, that death has de been defeated. It means that, that, that sin has been dealt with. It, it means that um, God's grace is given to us. It means that as the conquering king, Christ, rides back into town, he um, distributes to us of his grace and of his goodness the life of Christ is now at work within us and the gifts of Christ are now at work within us because Christ has conquered. Paul goes on to say this here. He says, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended to the lower regions of the earth? In other words, God saying, uh, Paul saying here that the one who has ascended here is the one who descended. Christ who ascended on high is the one who descended. There are a couple of different ways of understanding this text. I'm just going to say how I understand it. I believe Paul is here referring to Christ's incarnation, that God became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. He humbled himself because that humility is the main point Paul's making in this passage. Yeah. He descended. Christ sets us the example. He humbles himself. Why? So that he also then ascended, in verse 10, far above the heavens. Why? That he might fill all things. Yeah. He gives us of his Holy Spirit because he ascended back to the Father. Jesus said to his disciples, it's to your advantage that I go away, that I go to my father. For if I go to my father, my father will send another helper, the spirit of truth. And he'll be your, uh, your counsellor and, uh, and the, uh, God's spirit would come within us. The life of Christ is available to us because of the victory of Christ. Why do I say that? Because if we are going to be the body of Christ that he's called us to be, that vision of Jesus Christ to the world around about us, that vision of the, the manifesto of, of Christ, 
to the world around about us. Then we are that body as firstly we function together in unity and secondly as we know it's only by God's spirit at work in and through us. Amen. It's only by his grace at work in us. Amen. If we try and operate by human mechanisms and just relying on our own human ingenuity and our own uh, personal human works, it will get us nowhere. It's his life. It's his life that we need. It's his spirit that we need in and through us. And it's looking to his spirit each and every day. Final point, if I can just have the, the final point up here final part of the text here that i'm moving on to and that is that in order for a body to be healthy there needs to be a togetherness to the body that was paul's first point in all humility secondly there needs to be their um in there a life to the body and that's god's spirit at work in us his gifts at work in us because of his conquering over sin and death but the final simple point that I want to make in this text is that there needs to be a growth to the body. Yeah. A growth to the body. Being a healthy church. A growth to the body. The, the final vital thing is that we're a growing body, a healthy body. Yeah. And here we see that he gave gifts. Remember that picture of the king returning from battle? And he gives gifts. And Paul goes on to, to, to name five of those gifts here. Um, to the church of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastors, teachers. I could spend sessions upon sessions upon sessions on these. I've done seminars and day seminars on some of these gifts. But we do not have the time this morning. But I want to make a simple point. That God gives leadership gifts to his church. Why? In order that the church would do the work of ministry. That's right, yeah. Verse 12. To the equip the saints for the work of ministry. Who does the ministry in the body of Christ? Answer. You do. That's right, yeah. Amen. Oh, I'm not sure how that went down. Who does the ministry in the body of Christ? Answer. Yeah. God gives ministries to the church that the church might be equipped. That the church itself, every member of the church, does the work of ministry. And it's wonderful in Bryn Zion to see ways in which so many people are involved in, in ministries in various ways. Um, serving across ministry areas of the church, uh, influencing and affecting and shaping things that are going on in our local community. And it's wonderful to see that happening. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that's a plan of, of God's plan for his church. That each and every member plays a part in that church. You can be part of this great vision to be the body of Christ, yeah. to be equipped for works of service. That word equipped literally means to be um, to be what we were meant to be. That's what the word means, equipped. <laughs> it just means to, to be kitted out, to, 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 to be all that God had, the blueprint, and all that God had, had, had destined us to be. So what does that equipping look like? It looks like the unity of the faith. That's the truth we hold to. It looks like the knowledge of the Son of God. That's our discipleship. And are living more and more like Jesus. And then it looks like a goal. And that goal is maturity. It says here in the version that I've got. It's quite an old fashioned version. It says to a mature manhood. It's speaking of women too here. It's speaking of a maturity that we all have. Because the maturity is aligned to the perfect man. And that perfect man was Christ Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what a healthy church body looks like. <laughs> it's a healthy church body in which ministry is happening across the church body and where truth is being held to and when we are being formed and shaped 
into a mature body. What's maturity? Looking like Jesus. That's what maturity is. Christian maturity can simply be summed up in this word. It can be simply summed up in that Christ might be formed in us. It's that Christ is revealed in and through our lives. And that would make complete sense, wouldn't it? Because we're the body of Christ. And we can only be the body of Christ if we look a bit like Jesus. And, and, And that's the goal. Sometimes people can think, oh, being being mature as a Christian means knowing the Bible. Yeah, holding to the truth is really, really, really important. Understanding God's truth is important. But actually, you can know the Bible and not do anything about it. (laughs) What does Christian maturity look like? It looks like being like Jesus. I'll never forget when I first started teaching and having some advice off a mentor... And uh, we were talking about the, the wealth of experience that there is in the staff room at school. And staff who have taught for many, many years, who can, who can help, who can advise. And this mentor quickly said to me, and I've never forgotten it, and said, absolutely, they said, that's, that's absolutely correct. But don't make the mistake of concluding just because somebody has been in teaching a long time, just because they're older, that they have, they have much to teach you. <laughs> they said they may have been in teaching for 40 years, but they might have been 40 terrible years. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, that kind of balances it out <laughs> in some way. They might have been in teaching 40 years, but they might have been 40 terrible years. <laughs> You could have somebody in teaching less than 10 years and have a lot more they can really help and and teach and uh, equip you with. And do you know the same is true in Christ? The same is true in Christ. It's possible to have been a Christian for 50 years and still not be mature, but to have been a Christian for five years and to be very mature. (laughs) Because maturity isn't about age, Maturity is about how we're looking like Jesus. How are we measuring up to the fullness of the stature of the person of Christ? Of course, the opposite to maturity is being like children here. And it says the children in verse 14 are just tossed to and fro, carried by every wind and wave of doctrine, that's teaching, and, and by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. It's it, children are I guess being pulled this way and, and, and that way. And indeed, there's much in this world, and there's much, uh, I tell you what, it scares the living daylights out of me when I search for things online to do with Christian doctrine and Christian teaching. Because some of the stuff is so far off the beam, it beggars belief. It really does. But that's often where people might search for and go for and, and try and grow as a Christian just by not even realising who it is they're listening to or what they're following or what they do. There's all sorts of stuff out there. But maturity looks like coming before God's word, coming into sound Christian teaching, growing, maturing, becoming more like Jesus within our lives. Rather, verse 15, <coughs> not being like children, but rather speaking the truth in love. Yes. There's that word again, love. Do you know it's so simple? <laughs> we can so overcomplicate things. Love. Truth, yeah. Love, yes. You know, truth without love is harsh. Love without truth is wishy washy. Yeah. <laughs> truth and love together is a powerful combination. Speaking the truth in love. Yeah. We are to, I love these words, one of my favourite verses in the Bible. We are to grow up. You could get insulted, couldn't you, this morning if I said, I'll grow up. (laughs) But God said to me too, God said, we we are to grow up in every way. 
in everything that we do, in every way, into him. Here we come back to the goal, to be more like Jesus, who is the head, into Christ. And in the same way that my head and my mind, um, my, my brain functions, the faculties of my brain will dictate what, um, what happens within my body. In, in, in the same way, from him, from the head, um, the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, that's the whole function bit at the beginning that we're talking about, the unity bit, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Yes. That's precious. Yes. Wow. Who do we think we are? <laughs> this is who we are to be. Yeah. I really thank God for everything that he has done over many, many years in this church. I thank God for, you know, I get to hear things as a pastor that sometimes aren't announced at the front. Sometimes they're very really confidential things. Sometimes they're the things that are very really personal things. But I love the way that I hear of people getting alongside people. And loving them and encouraging them. I love the way I can. I know of people who are literally standing with people, fighting battles with them in prayer in the church, and seeing them come through. I love the way in which we see teams of people coming together to serve in, in various ways in the church. Let's keep on doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Let's keep on going in that direction. Because let's be that church that the love of Christ is building. All starts with humility. Humility of mind. Humility to take that correct position of ourselves before God. And for his image to be restored to us. The scriptures begin with God creating human beings in the image of God. The scriptures go on to tell us that, that image of God was somewhat lost, marred. By sin. The gospel is about that image being restored until one day we are perfectly like him in his presence. And the church is to tell the story of that. By the image of God, the person of Christ Jesus being revealed in and through us. I guess this is why in Brings I Am, for many, many years, I've constantly said it that we're to be a church that's plugged into Christ's life, connected up in Christ's life. And shining out Christ's light. Mm -hmm. It's all there in the text. It's not paper. When we're plugged into Christ's light, connected up in his love, we can be shining out his light to the world around mm -hmm. about us. What a vision we have to be the body of Christ to the world <laughs> around about us. And if you're here for the first time this morning, you can be part of that vision. It's yeah. not an exclusive vision. No. But the way in which we're part of it is to accept Jesus Christ Amen. as our Savior. To say, yes, Jesus died for me on the cross and rose again from the grave. And to become a child of God, to be part of God's family, and to be part of that body of Christ. And as we're part of that body of Christ, for us to remember the importance of unity, our relationships with one another, the importance of his life through us, Understanding what Christ has done and his growth, all doing the work of ministry, all becoming like Jesus, all growing in his love. That's what the world needs. That's what we're to be. The body of Christ. Let's pray. <coughs> Lord, I do thank you for the, your, your precious word to us. And as we've worked our way through these 16 verses this morning, may we be those who truly understand what it is to be the body of Christ. Work deep within our hearts. Perhaps if there's anything that we're to put right before you, that we'll do so. Anything that we're to deal with in terms of relationships, that we'll do so. Anything that we are to, to know by, um, in our lives that perhaps we've been going along in our own strength and to remember it's not by mind nor by power, by your spirit. 
that we grow as a healthy body, growing together as Jesus in Christ's love. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm.